Mike, so outside of Jalen Hurts, what's the one thing you'll watch the most closely with this Eagles team? The style of the defense. The style of there the defense. Go. Can they can they get to the quarterback? Are they more aggressive? Um, what does the secondary look like? You know, is Gannon sending his safeties, you know, out to the Jetro lot, uh, you know, behind Lincoln Financial Field, you know, so that they keep everything in front of them again? Um, or are they going to be able to play in a more aggressive fashion, force more turnovers, uh, play the way that I think Gannon wants to play? Uh, and yeah. that's certainly the way the fan base would like to play. We're back. Sports Take on this Friday. Hope you're doing well. Jacob Sports YouTube Network, Derek Gunn, Rob Ellis Barrett's off today. Always thrilled to have our next guest on. Uh, does an amazing job uh, covering sports in the Philadelphia area and making you think. And he might have the coolest backdrop that we've, we've seen now. What, what, what Mike, you've taken the, you got the paint out today just for us? I mean, I, thank you. I, I am in a coffee shop in Ambler, Pennsylvania, Rob. Mm. So, uh, you know. You roll with what you got, and it's a it's a nice shop. It's a good place. They make a good uh, ice latte, so I'm there good to go. go. I thought it, I, it, I, I thought it was one of his painted. kids' bedrooms. I thought it was <laughs> you were in a kid's bedroom. <laughs> yeah, not today, it. Gunner. Not today. There you go. I, so you, I, I, I'm sorry. I had to go. I have to go on record to say that this dude here it. is yes. one of my favorite people in the media in Philadelphia. Man, agreed. I love his quick wit. Um, I love his insightfulness. I, I, every time I read his stuff, I always come away saying. Wow, I didn't know that, you know, and that's yeah. kudos to him because when you do what he does for a living, you write every day. It's hard to be creative, you know, and maintain that consistency. And I think nobody in this market does it any better than my man right here. That's very kind of you to say, Gunnar. I really appreciate that. That well, means a lot I to me you, coming from you. you. Do, Mike is a, a guy who, who uh, is, makes mm -hmm. you think is provocative without being yeah. hot takey. And, and, you know, just trying to be someone who, who stirs things up. Right. For, I, I truly believe you believe what you write, Mike, and what you say. Anyway, so th this is way too much kissing up to Mike. Okay, let's <laughs> I know. I can't believe this. Yeah. I told you it's Friday, Rob. I'm in a happy place. I know. What today. is going on here, man? You guys We're are getting home. soft in your old age. I know. I know. This is pathetic. All right. Mike, guess what? No, you're clueless about that. No. All right. So, um, I know Mike, and by the way, you can, you can follow Mike on uh, on Twitter at Mike Sealski, and of course the uh, at PhillyInquirer dot com uh, does an unbelievable job. But Mike, I know your your latest is you wrote about the the new uh, arena, the mm -hmm. well, new that we're going to see in about nine years yeah. from now, right. um, at Tenth and Market, seventy sixth place, which is what it's being called. And you know, naturally, especially in this city, anything that's new, God forbid, we all lose our minds. Okay, we it's just. <laughs> What we what we do, what we are. I'm the I'm that that person too. So uh, let's start with where you're at uh, on it. What you think is this a good thing, bad thing, indifferent thing? Where do you stand? I mean, I'm a little skeptical, Rob. I'd say I'm about 52 percent, eh, 48 percent. Sounds pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, what I wrote was there are a lot of questions that are going to need to be answered about the building of this arena and the future of it, assuming it actually takes place. And it's really hard at this point to even know what kind of questions are the right ones to ask. Because as you said, this place won't even open for another nine years, right? Like, take one example, okay? Just, and this is something I raised in the column. Like, everybody was psyched back in the, you know, late 20th century, early 2000s, when the Eagles were building Lincoln Financial Field, okay? Oh, okay, they're leaving the vet behind. They're going to get their new stadium. Everything's going to be wonderful. One of the decisions that the Eagles made at the time was we are not going to put a roof or a dome of any kind on Lincoln Financial Field. It's going to be an open-air stadium. That's what Philadelphia wants, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? Looking at it you know, a couple decades out, you can't host a Super Bowl at Lincoln Financial Field mm -hmm. because it's an open-air stadium in the northeast section of the country. I guarantee you Jeffrey Lurie would love to host a Super Bowl there. So the decisions that the Sixers are going to make about this place, we have no idea what the ramifications of them are going to be when this place opens. You know, the evidence suggests that stadiums and arenas of this kind really don't do a whole lot to stir the economy of the cities that they're built in. Um, and I know that the Sixers are pledging that no city and state tax dollar is going to be used in the building of this. I'll believe it when I see it. So I think in theory, you're right, Rob. It sounds great, but... There's a whole lot that we have to find out yet. 
Well, well Mike, so, my concern, I'm sorry, Gunnar, I just did the follow-up. Where I'm at is, like, the I, I think traffic in general is going to be a challenge with this thing. The locale, you're not right off a of 95 or 76, kind of like you are with the sports complex. Um, and the notion of everybody just taking public transit is great in theory, right? If you had a competent, good transit, uh, you know, let's system, just, yes. my dad worked for SEPTA, okay? <laughs> SEPTA is brutal, okay? Yeah. It's not well run and it's, you know, there's a lot of other things that go along with this. So I just don't think it's as easy as people, hey, you just don't worry about driving. Uh, okay, I guess. That's my yeah. probably biggest concern. Yeah, I, I think you raise a great point, Rob. It's one I raised in the column. The fact is that the stadium complex in South Philadelphia is easily accessible to all the fans who live outside of the city, who live in the suburbs or who live in South Jersey. And you can't just say, well, they don't matter. This is all about the city of Philadelphia. Yes, the city of Philadelphia matters. And to Sixers fans in the city, it presumably might be easier for them to get to it. And, and maybe it helps the downtown. Maybe. But it's going to be harder for people who live outside the city to get there. And we don't know what the demographics of the city and the suburbs are going to look like come 2031. That's One of the right. points I made is, you know, people, many, many more people work remotely now. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to live in or close to Philadelphia to work in Philadelphia. So what is the demographics and the geography going to look like then? Is 10th and Market still going to have a lot of foot traffic? We don't know. We don't know any of these things. And that's not a reason not to do it, but it is a reason to ask some really difficult, hard questions. Yeah. So, 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 Mike, then why put so much money into the cosmetic surgery of the Wells Fargo Center if you knew somewhere down the road this is a possibility? It doesn't make sense. That's a way, it's basically a waste of money of dressing up a building you're only a tenant in to help them make more money. And now you're going to spend even more money to build an arena down the road. Yeah, you know, I don't know about that, Gunner. You're right. There's been tension um, between the Sixers and those who own the Wells Fargo Center, Comcast, ever since Josh Harris and his conglomeration bought the team. You know, we all know that. They wouldn't call it the Wells Fargo Center for a while, right? It was just the center. Um, <laughs> yep. So, you know, look, if, if you look at the arc of the Sixers since Josh Harris bought them, just the team itself. It's been up, it's been down, it's been rash decision after rash decision. It's been, we're going to try to win right away, we're going to go through the process, then we're going to try to win right away, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing Josh Harris loves to do is make money. It's the one thing that he's really good at. So, you know, if in the course of like getting to the point where he feels like he can build his own arena, he's willing to spend some money to be a better tenant in the Wells Fargo Center, at least ostensibly, I wouldn't put it past it. Um, but you're right, on its, on its face, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, we'll see how this goes. I mean, look, this has to be signed off on by a whole lot of civic leaders. They, they're going to have to get some OKs from, you know, residents in Chinatown and around Washington Square and all kinds of different places. So we, we are a long way from this actually happening. Yeah, no question. Mike, uh, so I, I again, I, I love jumping around with you here because I and I also know you keep a very close eye on the flyers. I don't know if you saw some of the things that John Tortorella had to say <laughs> yesterday to NBC Sports Philadelphia. And I did I did a whole rant yesterday, so I'm not going to go ballistic here. But you've been here for like 13 seconds, dude. They haven't won a cup since since 75. And you're already sort of like angry and kind of lecturing about fans being bummed out at the offseason. This doesn't bode well for for his tenure here, in my opinion. I, I, I'm not the biggest Tortorella guy. I'm, I'll be clear about that. But I'm seeing this. I'm like, way too soon, dude. Way too soon. Where do you stand on it? Yeah, I, I think it was a mistake on a couple of fronts. First of all, I, I, I covered towards in New York, Rob, and I liked covering him. He was interesting. He's heartfelt. I get that part of him. Um, here's the thing. He did it to the House Oregon. He did it to NBC Sports Philadelphia. That's who he ran it to. So that's the easiest thing in the world to do, okay? Because he's not going to get any pushback from that. Right. Um, he, he just isn't. And so... That bothered me a little bit. It was almost like he entered a safe space to be able to say this, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is, yeah, look, people have the right to be upset with the way the Flyers have kind of gone through their offseason. Um, as somebody who has been banging the drum for the better part of nine years that they need to find a fresh approach and have been waiting for them for nine years to find that fresh approach, I find it kind of amusing 
that so many people who cover the team are like, oh my gosh, they need to do things differently. Like, no kidding, guys. Like, I've been saying that for a long time. You know, welcome, you know, I feel like uh, Bruce Willis and Die Hard. Welcome to the party, Pat. Um, but did it bother me? Only insofar as, you know, he, he did it to an outlet where it was safe to do it. You know, talk to some of the other outlets who cover the team a little more objectively in the same sort of way. And I would feel a little better about it. But look, you know, he is who he is. Um, like I said, I kind of like covering him. I like the, the heartfelt way that he carries himself. Um, I don't think he's just a hothead. I think there's there's more going on there. Um, and he gets defensive fairly easily. That's that's just his track record. Mm-hmm. See, see, Mike, I, when, when Rob was going off the deep end yesterday with his rant, I countered with this. because I didn't agree with Rob. I agree with what he said. It's like too soon. But I also said, wait a minute. This is a guy who's standing up for his new employer. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with uh, it. Now, is that going to rub? Because I'm sure there are a lot more people that feel the way Rob does than what than the way I do in terms of, you know, this guy's coming in. That's his employer. He's going to stand up for his employer, plain and simple. Yeah, Gunnar, I think you're right to a great degree. And I do think the fan base is frustrated and angry. And oh, yeah. why didn't we get Johnny Goudreau and all this stuff as if, you know, clearing out all this cap space to sign one 29-year-old player, no matter how well, you know, in South Jer- grew up in South Jersey or not, was going to make a lick of difference with the team the way it is now. Um, I-, I think there's just a lot of bad vibes around the team at this point, and I think you're right, Gunnar. I think Tortorella just kind of took it on himself to kind of fall in this landmine and say, I'm going to be the one who stands up for the organization. This is who I am. This is the way I'm wired. So, so I'll take the brunt of the criticism for it. And I don't mind it, but it just seemed to me like, okay, if you're going to do that, like do it everywhere. Cause that was the only place he ran it to was NBC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fair enough. I also got to kick out of the whole salary cap thing. Like, like Chuck Fletcher inherited this mess. Chuck Fletcher is the reason why you're in cap hell and can't do some of the things. You, I, I'm sorry. I can't let it go, but anyway. well, he is and he isn't. They've been, they've been in cap hell for a yeah, long right. time. They really have. Yeah. No, I, he didn't start it, but he is, yeah. he's been here long enough where he could have fixed it or whatever. True. Anyway. Um, I digress. I digress. Uh, let's move on to the Phillies, Mike. Second half of the season starting here. Uh, they're, they're sitting in pretty good place right now. They're technically in the playoffs if the season ended right now. All things considered, awful start, managerial change. Harper out for a pretty decent chunk. Segura out for a bigger chunk. Lost Eflin at one point. Lost Suarez for at, at a point. I, you know, I'd be feeling – I'm feeling pretty optimistic here. I think they need some help. I think they need a starting pitcher. But considering you get Segura and Harper back, you know, not bad really. Where are you at with the Bills? Same. I'm in exactly the same place you are. I'm, I'm tentatively optimistic about it. The fact that they have kind of held the fort down and continued to win without Harper in particular and without Segura is encouraging to me. I do think – I think we've talked about this before. I think the presence of Rob Thompson, the managerial change from Joe Girardi, made a huge difference. Um, you know, I know Jonathan Papelbon went on this rant about how the Phillies, how could they fire Joe Girardi? It never works firing your manager in the middle of the season. Actually, sometimes it does. Go back to the 2003 Florida Marlins who fired, you know, Jeff Torborg and brought on Jack McKeon and ended up winning the World Series. Um, I think that matters. I think the atmosphere and environment, the change in that matters. Um, if they can get some starting pitching, and that's going to be a challenge, um, you know, but they have the right kind of general manager and Dave Dombrowski to do it. I think it could be a pretty interesting rest of the summer here in Philadelphia in terms of baseball. They're kind of, they might be kind of turning that corner from being a team that everybody's exasperated about all the time to being one that people could actually get behind. And that would be, that in and of itself would be a step forward. And see, Mike, and Mike, when I look at the Phillies, I've said time and time again over the past month since they've gone on this tear and these players started dropping by the wayside, look, just hold on. Just hold on. Reinforcements are coming. I, I, I do believe they need a, a little help, but I don't want to see them get too far ahead of themselves or outthink themselves and do do something to the point they're going to mess up the chemistry that got them this far. I don't want to see them have to give up too much to get a little in return to help them to get to the finish line. Yeah, it's interesting, Gunnar. You know, that's always a delicate balance. And Dombrowski's track record is that he will make those moves yeah. And they will generally work. They will cost that franchise in the years to come. You yeah. know, the, the the Red Sox, the Marlins, the Tigers, they tend to be kind of smoking husks once, yeah. he, once <laughs> he's finished with them. 
but they either get to a World Series or play very well or win a World Series. So it's really going to be interesting to see what he's able to get. And as you said, Gunnar, what he has to move to get. Yep. What are they in it for, Mike? Smoking husks? Yeah. I, I think right. smoking husks op- opened for meatloaf in 94. The uh, they were good. They, they were underrated, I thought. Yeah. They yeah. had enough, enough love from the 90s. Yeah. Smoking um, husk. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We got to go birds here. I, I turn one phrase and all of a sudden you guys are taking back all that praise. Yeah. You, you know what? You're not segment. our favorite anymore. <laughs> we're, we're done with you. Um, I know, I'm, I'm going to totally use that now. I'm going to totally steal it. Um, see, uh, Eagles, we're four days away here. And again, much anticipated, big off season, you know, for the team. And it feels like no matter what you say, every sentence has to end in but Jalen Hurts and all that. But just give me your sense, your sort of overview of what that you you expect, what you think, how optimistic you are uh, for the Eagles going into the season. I'm pretty optimistic. I think they should win 10, 11, 12 games, somewhere in that range, depending on how well Hurts plays. Um, they've got everything else around him in theory. Certainly in practice, they have maybe the best offensive line in the NFL. Um, they added A.J. Brown, which should, you know, be as kind of a trickle-down uh, benefit to every all the other skill position players on that offense. And you're mm-hmm. talking about guys like Devontae Smith and Dallas Goddard, who are re- already really good. Theoretically, they help the defense. Um, you know, everybody knows Jonathan Gannon, in addition to Hurts, is the other guy who's really going to be kind of under the microscope. Um, but I think you'll get a pretty good sense in training camp. You know, go back to, and Gunnar will know this, from being there every day back then, go back mm-hmm. to training camp 2017. There was a good vibe around that team. Mm-hmm. You watch that team mm-hmm. practice and you're like, okay, these guys are good. You know, this is a veteran laden club. Carson Wentz has taken a step forward. Imagine saying such a thing now, but he had at the time, you know, and you just got a sense, okay, this team is, it looks pretty good. Um, so we'll get that sort of similar sense in training camp. I think, you know, if, if Hertz looks sharp, despite whatever Gunner sources are telling him and whatever, commotion he's causing on twitter um, <laughs> hey social media caused the problem mike i just gave information dude dude you preacher me choir you know <laughs> I, I i know exactly what you mean um you know we'll see but i i am optimistic about the eagles but you guys are right and it's it's such a cliche by now and the season hasn't even started yet as jalen hurts goes so this team will go all right mike so outside of jalen hurts what's the one thing you'll watch the most closely with this Eagles team? The style of the defense, the style of the defense. Can they, can they get to the quarterback? Are they more aggressive? Um, What does the secondary look like? You know, is Gannon sending his safeties, you know, out to the Jetro lot, uh, you know, behind Lincoln financial field, you know, so that they keep everything in front of them again. Um, Or are they going to be able to play in a more aggressive fashion, force more turnovers, uh, play the way, that I think Gannon wants to play, uh, and yeah. that's certainly the way the fan base would like to see him play. Mike, do you do you worry at all? Um, you know, it, it appears, and this is good. I mean, it, it means you have the personnel to at least try it. But there, this is going to be a pretty complex defense in that odd odd front, even front. They're going to be doing a lot of different things. You're going to have to incorporate Hassan Reddick the right way. You know, there, there's a lot of things to be looking at. It feels like there's a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, for a defense that was solid last year in, in a lot of ways, I think I get too much heat. But do you worry it's too much? Should this be dumbed down a little bit or simplified a little bit? Or you think, you know what? Hey, man, go. Yeah, you know, they don't have too many young players, Rob, that, that I would worry of in those situations that would be confused or would struggle to adjust. You know, you still got enough veterans on that side of the ball. You know, Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox. Josh Sweat has been here a little while now, you know, yeah. certainly not as old as those guys, but you know, they've got some guys who've been around a bit and, you know, even a guy like N'Kobe Dean, assuming he's going to be kind of at the nerve center of all this smart kid, you know, was the top defensive player on a terrific defensive team that won a national championship. You know, the stars seem to be aligned for them to be able to handle whatever Gannon's going to throw at them. So if they struggle in that regard, I would be surprised if they would. Interesting. All right, let me let me swing it back to hoops. Uh, we talked about the arena, but I know you also wrote about James Harden. You had an interesting take in that a lot of folks are looking at it like, hey, he did the Sixers a favor, uh, allowed them to be able to make some moves, you know, took a cheaper number, kind of bet on himself with a one in one deal, if you will. But you, you you looked at it a little bit differently in that it wasn't as this, you know, just altruistic, you know, <laughs> move by James Harden. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I, you know, I just looked at it like a lot of fans and a lot of people who covered the team were framing him as like the second coming of St. Francis of Assisi for taking this pay cut, you know, in the first year of 
his his contract or whatever it was going to be, you know, the, the, the two-year deal that he ended up signing. Um, look, if he had opted in and got for the $47.3 million, he certainly could have done that and everybody would have gone, okay, well, that's expected. And the Sixers would have go, okay, James, awesome. Good luck to you next season um, because – Opting in would have necessarily made them a weaker team, right? If he opts in, they can't, they don't have the cap space to go out and get PJ Tucker, one of James Harden's buddies, uh, the guy who's going to hit corner threes and lend toughness. They can't, you know, go and make all the other additions that they've made that, that his cap space allowed them. And that in turn are going to allow him, in theory, to have a better season, right? Like if James Harden had opted in, the Sixers were going to be weaker for it. And in turn, he would be looked at as a selfish player, a guy who just took the money and said, okay, well, I'm getting mine, and whatever happens with this team, so be it. Then he would have become a free agent, presumably. And how many teams around the NBA are going to look at a guy like that and say, oh, yeah, we're giving him a max contract, or we're giving something close to what he can get by opting in you know, in 2023 with the Sixers? Um, it's it's kind of complex, and it takes a while. I'm just not convinced that by sacrificing that 15 million dollars that he would have gotten under his, you know, by opting in this year, that in the end he ends up taking less money. You know, he's going to get 34 million this year. He's already assured himself of at least what 33 million the following year. He may end up with more. He may end up with less. I, I, it just bothered me that people were looking at this like, oh, he's doing this out of the goodness of his heart. It's the rare player who's going to do who's going to take less money out of the goodness of his heart. Yeah. James Harden doesn't have a track record that suggests he'd be the kind of guy to do that. Well, I guess so, the good thing. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah. So with in. the moves they so with the moves they've made, <clears throat> are they a better team? Are they a team that can that can overtake Milwaukee, Boston, Miami? I think they're a better team, Gunner. I don't know if they're good enough to overtake the teams that you mentioned. Um, but they have to kind of go for it. They have they're in a position where they have to roll the dice. What else are they going to do? You're going to start over? They can't start over. They've got Joel Embiid in the prime of his career, presumably. They've got, they're trying to milk the last little bit out of James Harden that they can. They've got Tyrese Maxey, who seems poised to take a step forward and really become a superstar. He's got all the intangibles that you'd want in a young player. You've got Tobias Harris, who's a very good player. You've got, they got to take their shot right now. And so are they good enough to get past those teams? I think it depends on how good P.J. Tucker is and you know Melton and some of the other additions that they made. But they don't have another choice. They kind of they kind of put themselves in this position, so they got to go with it. Mike Sealski joining us. Mike's the uh, the author of a great book. If you haven't gotten it yet, uh, it is Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. and the uh, Pursuit of Immortality: The Rise. You got to check it out. It is it is really good. Mike, I ask you this uh, all the time. Just take different you know bits and pieces you know about the book. Was your initial direction to take it this way, or were you going to do just sort of an all-encompassing Kobe? Like, what made you take take the early years, for example, and and that make that the crux of the book? How did you get to that point? It was the story that I could tell well, Rob. That's basically the way I looked at it, and it was the story of Kobe's life that was most interesting to me. You know, growing up in the Philadelphia area, having been an undergraduate at LaSalle University at the time that Kobe was supposedly considering flirting. going there, yeah. flirting with going there. Joe Bryant was an assistant coach at the time that I was a student there. And the elevator pitch I had for the book, and I'm sure I've used this line with you guys before, was I wanted to do Batman Begins for the Black Mamba. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell Kobe's origin story. And I thought that if I did it the right way, that somebody who was familiar with him only from his 20 years with the Lakers uh, could read a book like that and understand how he became the athlete and the figure that he became, you know, you can you can tell the story of the man in full by telling the story of the kid he used to be. Mike, you have the luxury of covering multiple sports. You know, unlike a lot of uh, writers and columnists that, that that focus on football or whatever. What's your favorite sport to cover? That's a great question, Gunner. Um, I love the NFL because everybody pays so much attention to it, and because mm -hmm. the games are so infrequent that 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 injects each game with more importance and it opens you up to more storylines. I will say this without question, my two favorite events to cover are number one, the NCAA tournament. I love it mm -hmm. when Villanova in recent years and the other big five teams in the past have made deep runs. I just, I love the stories that come out of that. And I love covering the NHL playoffs. 
being okay. inside an arena for a National Hockey League playoff game is like being inside a pot of boiling water. And, mm. you know, there is a part of me that wishes the Flyers were better just so I could cover that environment because it is so cool to be in an arena like that, whether you're talking about the Wells Fargo Center or Madison Square Garden or pick an arena. Um, it's like a bomb goes off, you know, when the home team scores a goal. And it's, it's just electric, and I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, Mike, what's next? What should we be on the lookout from you, column-wise, wh- whatever the case may be? What's coming up? Um, well, Dick Vermeil, as you guys know, is getting inducted into the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame in a couple of weeks, and I spent some time with, with him at his house in Chester County. I'm working on a, a real in-depth uh, profile of him, kind of framed around the fact that 40 years ago, he burned out, right? That's why he retired from the Eagles, and he was kind of the canary in the coal mine for mental health issues in sports. I think the idea that, you know, do we really know what's going on with these coaches and players? And so I talked to him at length about that, about his life. Um, so that's kind of the big project that I've got going on. And, uh, and that should drop sometime before. I think the, um, the induction ceremony in Canton is Saturday, August 6th or 7th, whatever that Saturday is. Pretty so close. the piece yeah, will drop. Weeks. Yeah. 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 The Very piece cool. will drop before that. Mm. Awesome. Mike, looking forward to it, man. And I uh, appreciate Thank you hopping on for a couple minutes appreciate as it. always. Keep up the great work. Okay. And, uh, Next time you're on, we need an unbelievable background like the one you have right now. I'm just telling oh, no. you, you. Might want to start doing some work at the house or whatever. I don't, I'm you just, know what? I will just I'll paint the wall in my office like psychedelic colors. You know, yes. it looks like the mystery machine in the Scooby Doo cartoons. Yes, yeah. Exactly. It'd be great, guys. Thank you so much. Water. Yeah, yeah. Eyes I, are watering. Looking at I that. appreciate the kind words so much. Thanks. Absolutely, Mike. Mike. All right, we'll Take talk care, to you buddy. soon, man. Take care. That's Mike Sealski. Yeah, he does. He does. We weren't just blowing smoke. I mean, he he is a guy no. that will make you think when you read him. And not only that, he's a genuine article too, dude. You know, he can dish it out. He can take it. Yep. When you jet, we go back. I go back and forth with him jabbing, man. He, you know, he's like, he can play, he can match you punch for punch, man. Yeah. You know? And that's what I love about him. Doesn't take anything personal, mm-hmm. you know. And, um, you know, such an accomplished writer and a well thought out writer. Yeah. Um, I can't, you know, there, there's some guys when you read their writings and sometimes you just go, okay, that was okay. But I can't remember the last time I've read something of his and didn't come away thinking, hmm, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, you I'm know, with I never thought about that, you know. And that's and, ultimately what a columnist is there to do. Yeah, exactly. Think. And he yep. does it as well as anybody. Yep, good stuff, man, good yep. stuff. All right, so we, uh, we'll we come back. We're going to do a little hodgepodge, Gunner. We'll do a little Phillies. We'll set the table for the Phillies. We'll do – we'll finish – we didn't We didn't get to our rankings. We didn't finish our rankings. Rankings for our, – Our NFL. Did we finish our NFL rankings? Yeah, we did. We, we did. No, uh, no, 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 uh, team, oh. team. Oh, no, 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 no. We didn't get to them. Our NFL team power rankings. We're going to do uh, 21 through 32 and then close Super Bowls. We'll we'll get all that done in addition to to all of our other stuff that we got to get to birthdays and, you know, all the stuff that went down on on this date. Uh, We'll get to all of that in the final hour of the program. D-Gun, Rob Ellis, we are Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. Don't go anywhere.